who you are defines how you build. So I'll start with a little bit about uh, me and how I ended up here. I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, both my parents are software engineers, PhDs in computer science. It seemed very obvious that I was going to walk down this path in tech. Um, I came to Stanford not exactly knowing what I wanted to do, uh, but thinking maybe computer science or something, something in, in this domain. Uh, she surprisingly was not that straightforward for me. When I took my first couple of courses in computer science, I was intimidated and decided to not major in CS. Uh, and it was, um, she, so I ended up doing electrical engineering because I felt like it's still technical, but at least no one has been programming EE circuits since they were eight, uh, the way it felt like many of my classmates in computer science had been. So I switched over into electrical engineering, decided I didn't like that at all, and so was trying to figure out my way out of EE, um, and only ended up majoring in computer science because one of my friends had essentially dared me to do it. Uh, I knew I was going to do a co-term, like a great deal to get a master's degree with only one extra year, um, and I've been thinking of doing it in some other field. Uh, mainly because I was chickening out of doing something technical, and my friend dared me. Uh, so that's how I ended up doing EE and computer science at Stanford. Um, and I was just very lucky to be here in the Valley. Ended up doing some pretty cool internships, um, but also very unintentionally. So I, you know, wandering around the career fairs at Stanford, um, ran into Google and Facebook at the, uh, and hosting their, their booths. Um, and mainly just to get the free gifts from these companies had to turn in my resume and that turned into getting these internships. Um, so a very unintentional path. Uh, even though I had grown up here, I still didn't quite know what I wanted to do and wasn't very confident in my direction. Um, I was very fortunate to be connected to the Mayfield Fellows Program through a number of friends I had who had gone through it, and uh, that was my entree into the world of actual startups, Silicon Valley, entrepreneurship. And so uh, when I graduated, I was debating where I should go. I was thinking of doing one of the, the big tech companies. It was very cool to go work at Google or Facebook. Um, but having just done Mayfield, I thought I should maybe give the startup thing a go. And I ended up joining Quora, um, the question and answer site. Back then, it was only four people. So I was the fifth person to join the team. This was pre-funding, super early. Uh, ultimately, I decided it was worth the shot. Um, it wasn't really that risky as a software engineer. I figured if it went out of business, I would just go be a software engineer somewhere else. Um, and that was an amazing ride at Quora. Um, I actually discovered what it means to be a software engineer, which I somehow hadn't learned, despite getting two degrees in engineering from Stanford. It wasn't until I was actually on the ground building a product at Quora that I realized how fun it was to be building. Uh, but at the same time, there was something that felt a little bit off, and I hadn't identified it when I was in school or even during my internships, but just something felt wrong. Um, and about a year into working full time, I seriously questioned whether I should be in tech. Even though I loved coding, I loved building products, I just felt like I didn't belong, um, and I didn't know what it was until I realized that maybe it had something to do with gender and my identity of who I am. When I looked around me, the industry, there were just not a lot of other women. Um, and that realization started to kick in. Um, and I started to see that there were actually potentially systemic issues. Um, and for the longest time, I, I think I didn't want to realize this um, because Silicon Valley is so bought into this idea of the meritocracy and the people with these shiny degrees and who are uh, the startup founders and su success stories these people deserve it because they're the best, um, and the best people always succeed, and the people who are succeeding are the best people. Um, and I was very fortunate to have some of these markers of privilege and these credentials. I had two degrees from Stanford in technical fields. I'd done all the right internships. So I wanted to believe like I deserve my success. I wanted to believe in this system of meritocracy. Uh, so it was a pretty rough realization for me that the system isn't fair. Um, and a little bit embarrassing to think on how late I was to become woke to this idea. Like I didn't participate in women's groups uh, in college. 
and I wasn't particularly aware of feminism or social justice or any of these things. Um, the way I try to console myself about this now is that if I weren't embarrassed by where I was 10 years ago, I haven't been growing enough. Um, but it was a pretty belated realization. Um, at the same time, so it's just concurrently uh, working at Quora, because it is this uh, user-generated content site, we needed a lot of content on Quora. All of us as early employees also wrote a lot of answers just to try to make the site seem more interesting. Uh, and one of the few topics I felt like I could write confidently about was my experience being a woman in engineering, a woman in tech. Uh, so inadvertently started becoming more vocal on the subject just because we were trying to fill the site with content. Um, and it was actually a really great experience to, to hear from other people who would write back to me privately and say, thank you so much for voicing these experiences. Like, I'm not in a position where I can write about these issues, um, but I feel the same way. And I also heard from people who were not women in engineering, but say a black person in tech who said, you know, it's not quite the same, but there are also no other people that look like me in the room. Um, and I started to see much more like how prevalent these patterns of marginalization are. So that was, um, I guess, the beginning of my starting to become woke journey. Um, after Quora, I went to Pinterest. Uh, Pinterest was also very small when I joined. Um, it was about 10 people. Um, so again, very fun startup journey. For a while, when I was at Pinterest, I just wanted to focus on the engineering side. We were scaling like crazy. Uh, we're doubling the user base every month and a half. So we just had plenty of work to do, and I was much more focused on building out the startup um, engineering side of things. But uh, one thing that was really remarkable about my time at Pinterest was that it was the first place I felt like I was treated as a software engineer and not a female software engineer. And that was a really big realization to me because I had never known before what it would feel like to be treated this way. Um, even when I was in school, there was no overt discrimination, but being one of only, let's say, like two women in a computer science classroom, it, it did feel weird. Um, for example, if I was sleeping in class, the professor would always know that I stood out a little bit too much. But I always felt like there was something unusual about being a woman in all these spaces that I was in. And uh, at Pinterest was the first time I felt like I was treated as an engineer first. Uh, so that was a really nice revelation to have. Um, and so also encouraged by that culture at Pinterest, I started again to pick up some of the discussion of diversity issues. And uh, in 2013, um, as, as Tina mentioned, I, I wrote a Medium post um, calling out the diversity industry about its lack of data, or the technology industry about its lack of data about diversity. And the origin of this was um, that I had gone to the Grace Hopper Conference, which is, is like a big conference every year, annual celebration of women in computing. Now it's over 10,000 people that go. Back then it was a little bit smaller. Um, and I had heard Cheryl Sandberg uh, talking about how dire the situation was for women in technology, how the numbers were dropping precipitously. And I just realized that there, there weren't any numbers. And it was so ironic that being in an industry that's so data-driven that we didn't have data on diversity. Like, as an engineer, I had had to build out A-B testing frameworks. I had to instrument every product launch I had done. Um, we poured over the metrics, did all these dashboards. It was because we cared about those things and we wanted to optimize them. But the fact that there was no data on diversity signaled to me that we were trying to hide the problem or minimize it. Um, and we weren't actually serious about solving it. And so this Medium post I wrote was just a call. It was a question. It was a call to action. And uh, I didn't really expect anybody to respond to it. Um, but surprisingly, a lot of people followed up and sent in their numbers around women in engineering. I still run this repository, and, and people still submit their data. Um, but some of the key learnings there to me were that people actually did care and just didn't know what to do. Uh, but giving them a very concrete action item, which was, count up your number of women in engineering, count up your total number of engineers, and submit that someplace so we can start building a benchmark. That very easy, concrete action, people were very happy to take it. They just didn't know what to do before. Um, and that ended up kickstarting that whole wave of disclosures where Google um, followed up in May of 2014, Facebook, LinkedIn, Microsoft, Apple, like all these companies are now in, in the pattern of releasing annual diversity data reports, which is pretty cool. Um, Unfortunately, the numbers have not been very good in the last five years. Um, so 
now oftentimes people ask me, like, so great, you did this thing in 2013, like, where are we in 2018? How much has happened in the last five years? And uh, sad thing is there hasn't been a ton of progress. Um, there's very slow progress in the numbers and percentages of women in engineering. Um, a lot of VC firms have in the past year hired their first female partners. So there's a little bit of progress there. Um, there's been some backsliding on racial diversity. So um, this nonprofit, Ascend, has done some analysis of this and seen that while white women in leadership have um, increased their percentages, every other um, ethnicity has lost ground in leadership. So we're, we're backsliding there. Um, there's a lot of talk about diversity, and um, it's getting more nuanced, but it hasn't gone much beyond that. Um, some of the things that are nice to see in that discussion of diversity is that we are starting to talk about uh, diversity as more than just gender and more than just white women, for example. Um, we're talking about diversity and inclusion, no longer just diversity, but thinking about once you have different people in the room, do you actually incorporate everyone's opinions and allow everyone the same chances to succeed? Um, we've started to advance some of our terminology around things like gaslighting, uh, which I didn't realize uh, was happening to me, but this idea of making people feel like they're crazy um, and that things are in their head when they talk about these issues. Um, when I first started talking about being female in tech and maybe having a different experience than the men around me, I was told that there was no sexism. And just because I believed that there was sexism, I was projecting it around me. Uh, now I know that there's a term for this, which is gaslighting, and it's good that we're starting to advance some of the vocabulary and we can start to identify these things and make progress around them. Um, some other things that have happened in the last few years is more of a spotlight on VC, the venture capitalists, and not just on the tech companies, which is good. Um, they're a very important part of the ecosystem. VCs are the ones that decide whose startup ideas even get a chance um, to, you know, to try to make it. Um, but unfortunately, I think some of what's happened with all the discussion of diversity is that it's turned into uh, diversity as PR or theater. Um, sometimes diversity is used as a way to get deal flow in VCs, which is unfortunate. Um, at the same time, I do think it's better that people at least say that they care about diversity rather than not saying that they care. Uh, so at least it's the general trend that people will say it's diversity is a good thing. Um, and hopefully we can just start to close that gap between what is said and, and what is done. Um, some of the things that have happened in terms of like what people are saying, like these pledges, it's now very in vogue to have pledges. Uh, the White House did a big coalition with a bunch of tech companies in 2016, asking them to pledge to have goals around recruitment and retention and promotion of minorities and, and women and to release their diversity data and to build partnerships, try to increase the pipeline. So like about 80 companies signed on to this pledge. It was like a great press thing uh, in 2016. And a year later, only 17 of the firms had actually followed through on anything. So there's still a little bit of a tendency for people to say nice things and not actually follow through, um, which is something we'll have to, to counter. Um, there's also starting to be some backlash. So the New York Times ran some articles recently, um, a few months ago, about how the men in tech think it's gone too far. Uh, and some of you may know about the Google engineer who wrote a memo last summer uh, talking about how the diversity efforts were misguided. Um, I was not a huge fan of his arguments, but there were a number of men who uh, were very glad that he was giving voice to some of these opinions that he had. Um, I guess some of the question is like, why is it so hard to make progress? Um, and I think some of it is that people like this Google engineer, James Seymour, want to hold on to their position. Uh, they're in a position of privilege and power, and they don't want to give it up. Uh, and that's very understandable. Like People don't like losing things. Um, people want to believe in the meritocracy, just as I did before. They want to believe that the system is fair, and the people that have succeeded want to believe that they deserve their success. So it's very hard to dismantle these feelings um, that are very deep down. Even for the people that are very committed to change, it's difficult to change culture and processes. And these things take a very long time. Um, so it's hard to see immediate gains. And sometimes that can be frustrating when efforts are being put out there and we don't see immediate uh, changes. 
And particularly in the, in the startup world, where you're doing a lot of trade-offs, long-term versus short-term, if you're in a startup that only has so much runway and you just need to ship your product and get some customers, it's hard to prioritize diversity uh, in, the, in that short term. But what happens then is that you start to accrue this uh, diversity debt. So similar to technical debt, if you start doing things in ways that aren't sustainable, it works in the short term because you need to get over that hurdle. You need to hit that product launch. Um, but as that debt accrues, sometimes at some point it, it becomes so much that you can never recover from it. Um, and there are some companies that have gone so far down these paths, it's, it's kind of unclear if they'll ever be able to fix um, their problems and pay down that diversity debt. Uh, it's just, it's easy to keep doing things the way we've been doing them. Um, one example of something that accrues diversity debt is the way a lot of companies do hiring, which is based on referrals. And it's very easy to refer people from your network that you know that are similar to you, uh, that you worked with in the past, and bring them in. It's very easy to get going like that. Uh, what happens then, though, is because these networks, social networks, tend to be very homogenous, you end up just perpetuating the, the um, demographics of your initial teams. And the further along you get, the harder it is to, to change that. Once your team is thousands of people and they're still doing all these referrals and everybody looks very similar, it's hard to, to shift very hard in the other direction. Um, OK, so lots about problems. Uh, it would be nice to also talk about solutions. Um, so a couple years ago, I and a few other women in tech who would often get together and talk about these issues, were frustrated about all the talk of problems, as I just laid out. Um, and we thought we should actually start trying to focus on solutions and see what we could do instead of having the same conversations over and over again. And uh, what came out of those initial discussions a couple years ago was a nonprofit called Project Include, which I'm now a founding advisor to. And our, our idea was that. Uh, we need to start giving people solutions. And there are people who want to do the right thing and just don't know what to do. Uh, we were often getting people asking us for one-on-one -on -one coffee so we could give them just a brain dump on what they could do around diversity. And we thought it would make more sense to be more scalable if we actually just wrote down those recommendations and tried to compile these resources to make it easier for people. Uh, but as we came together, we also thought about what it means to have sustained solutions and ones that actually make change in the long term. And we started with core values. Um, the first of these is true inclusion. And this idea of not just solving for gender first, which often ends up being white women first, um, because of that proximity to the power structures now. Thinking about inclusion um, that actually encompasses everybody. So instead of just widening your circles of exclusion, getting rid of, rid of those circles of exclusion altogether. Um, thinking about intersectionality, so it's not just gender and race and class and religion, but all these things um, cross with each other and all these different dimensions of people's identities and thinking through solving that in a very holistic way. Um, we thought it was important that there be comprehensive solutions that are not just uh, you know, this tactic here and this other tactic here. People are very into the idea of having a three-point checklist of top three things I can do. Um, they want to hear about things like the Rooney Rule, which is just make sure that you have some diversity in your candidate pool, and then that will resolve in, in better metrics um, downstream. They just want to have these easy check-the-box solutions. But it's not that easy of a problem to solve. It's, it's culture, um, it's processes, it's really deeply ingrained power structures. Um, and I would treat uh, diversity analogous to many other things that companies are trying to solve, and say around uh, growth and trying to acquire users, uh, monetization. And sure, there are blog posts where people say, like, all you have to do to solve culture is these three things. But that's never the full story. Um, and people spend a lot of time thinking about what are the different ways that we can grow our consumer software company. There's all these different hacks you can try, um, and lots of different tactics you will read about from other people. but in the end, you need to have a comprehensive strategy. And you may be able to pick and choose some of these different uh, tactics from other people. But you need to think through the problem holistically. And um, the third core value we had uh, was around accountability. And that comes from metrics. As we had seen before, not having any sort of metrics, uh, it was very easy to say, we're working on the problem and never see any gains. Uh, we thought it was important that around diversity and inclusion, we're actually setting goals and measuring ourselves against those goals. And sometimes we're going to miss those goals, which is fine. Sometimes you miss your growth targets or your sales targets. But that doesn't mean you don't set them. 
Um, so that's been very core to all the work that we do. And uh, what we ended up doing as, as this group of eight people is we just wrote down everything we knew to be best practice, knowing that best practices are going to change and we're going to learn more about what works and what doesn't work. But we wanted to put a stake in the ground, write down those things, and also start to build a community around those where we can update them. So a little bit like open source software where people who are solving some problem will you know, write a bunch of software, put it out there. Um, other people who want to, who find some benefit can use it. If they make extensions, um, if they want to add to it, they want to help maintain, they can also be part of that community. So thinking of the diversity and inclusion work and recommendations as almost like open source and trying to pull in these learnings from the community as well. And so we have this resource out um, on the website. We also have started doing more programmatic work uh, through Startup Include, where we actually have cohorts of companies that come in and uh, we help them to instrument a lot of their diversity and inclusion numbers. So it's not just demographics, it's not just how many black women do you have in engineering and how many Hispanic men do you have in leadership? It's not just those demographic numbers, but also things like how included are people feeling? So um, the sorts of things that people will study in engagement surveys, like does everyone feel like they have the same chances to succeed? Do they agree with the direction of the company? Um, do they feel confident uh, in like where the product is going? Um, so we help these companies to measure this data, and we're still building out those baselines and those benchmarks. Um, but we think it's, it's really important that we start to, to build community around this. Um, we also recognize that we're a small part of the ecosystem, and there are actually a lot of great people um, doing work in this space. Um, some are doing it professionally, so there's a good number of nonprofits um, and for-profits doing work in diversity and inclusion. I think sometimes it will just be hard to see change because these are such hard problems, and it will take a long time before we see success. Um, there are also a lot of people who are working on this as a second shift of emotional labor on top of their normal jobs. Um, people who are software engineers or leaders, and they just do this on top of what they already do. So I do think it's important to give a shout out to those people. Um, we just need more <laughs> in that. I think ultimately, um, tech leaders need to take responsibility here because uh, they set the priorities. Um, diversity and inclusion, even though everybody says it's a priority, is not actually a priority if everything else gets prioritized above it. Um, and if companies are consistently prioritizing you know, speed of hiring over diversity and inclusion, like that is what's going to happen in those companies. Um, so it really has to be driven top down. And you can see some success from grassroots efforts, but really leaders need to take on more of that responsibility. Um, I think for people in this room and people who are, who are listening to this um, later, there may be questions like, well, what can I do? Um, so it's great to say like, the leaders need to do certain things, um, but what can I do? Like, how can I be helpful? Um, I think for students, uh, you actually have a lot of leverage um, as candidates that people want to recruit. Um, one of my friends who's a, a software engineer in industry said when she gets recruiting messages, She'll use that leverage she has as a viable candidate to ask companies hard questions. Um, so things like, what are your diversity and inclusion numbers? So hopefully the company is tracking diversity and inclusion numbers, and hopefully they're good. You can ask about things like uh, gender breakdowns or racial breakdowns in engineering, in leadership, on the board. Um, you can ask about things like family leave, parental leave policies. Are you offering paid parental leave? Um, above and beyond what's required, which is very little by the law. Um, one interesting one that my friend asked about is, uh, do you have trans-inclusive health coverage? Um, and it's difficult for some of these people who are in marginalized groups to have to ask for these things. Um, if you're in a position where you have some privilege and you, can, and you have some leverage and you just ask these questions, it helps to tell companies that you care about this and people care about this and it will help them to prioritize these things as well. It also just gives you useful information about the company and the culture and if you want to join a company like that. Um, for people who are looking to start companies um, or end up being leaders in, in companies, um, you can also use the leverage that you have to ask these questions. For example, if you're a founder and you're raising money, you can, especially if you're a, a hot startup and people are, uh, VCs are trying to get in, you can ask these VCs about their diversity inclusion numbers and what their efforts are. Um, there was recently 
uh, pledge going around Founders for Change where these founders are asking the VC firms that they may be taking investment from, do you have female partners um, and are you making investments in a diverse set of entrepreneurs? Um, one, of the, one of the projects I've been working on recently is something called Moving Forward. And uh, what we've been doing is asking VC firms to publish anti-harassment policies and points of contact. So this is a really basic thing that came out of uh, some of the Me Too movement last year, but realizing that a lot of firms don't have guidelines around what is appropriate behavior or not, and what can, or what should be the, the follow-up, and what, where is the accountability. Um, so we've been asking founders when they are talking to VC firms to ask if they have these anti-harassment policies, and if not, to join on with this moving forward movement. Um, it's not a huge ask, but it does help to shift that ecosystem a little bit. Um, and for founders and, and people who are leaders and decision-making roles, you can hire diverse teams and make, make that a priority. Uh, it's very easy to hire from your networks. I, I know how it feels. Um, I want to hire people that I've worked with before and I know really well, but I think it's also really important to, to look outside your networks um, and get more of that diversity in the room. And it may take longer, but it's worth it in, in the long term. Um, for everyone, uh, not just the people, um, especially those people who are not from marginalized groups, you can use the privilege and position that you have to advocate for others. Uh, one of the most powerful things is thinking about who's not in the room and advocating for them. Um, and I see this even in our diversity and inclusion circles, like in the people I work with. There's sometimes we, we get very fixated on the particular groups we're advocating for. So there's women in tech, um, there's black and brown people in tech. And then I also realize there's many people who are not even represented in the room because they're so marginalized. Like there's no native people in many of these rooms. Um, we don't have a lot of diversity of religion. So we're not talking about what is, what is the experience like to be Muslim in our tech companies. Um, so there's so many other people who are not even in these rooms. So that, that exercise of thinking about who's not here um, and can I try to at least give them a little bit of voice or at least call attention to the fact that they're not here. Um, how can we start to solve these problems? Um, I think it's important that we don't just let the people who are from underrepresented groups do all the work of trying to push for diversity and inclusion. That often happens where the one woman in the room will be asked to do the work of diversity, plan this panel, or invite the speaker, um, or mentor the younger people. And I think a lot of times, those people from underrepresented groups will feel some of that burden to do that work, and, and they want to do it. Um, but it's also unfair to ask those people to do all that work all the time. Um, and so for those people who have more bandwidth, aren't necessarily from those groups, being able to spend that time to advocate for others is really powerful. Um, so it's a bit tricky sometimes. You want to amplify uh, these voices that aren't heard as much um, and help, people, uh, help to bring people into the room. But you also don't want to take up the space there. So there have been some cases of people who wanted to be helpful but ended up hogging all of the, the limelight. Um, instead of giving the stage to people who are traditionally underrepresented or aren't getting um, that stage time. Um, another thing that all of us can do is push for just better processes in general. Uh, and you know, at startups in particular, it's pretty easy because there are often no processes at all. So just introducing some basic ones can be very helpful um, around things like hiring, for example, um, and promotion. When I first started working at Quora uh, and I was told to interview people, they just threw me into a room and told me to come out with a yes or no answer, which is very standard for startups. It's like, just go. There's no process yet. Um, but much better practice would be actually having rubrics and having criteria for what you're looking for that helps to standardize. Um, it also helps remove a lot of bias. So there's been interesting academic research on this. Um, if you don't ask people to specify what they're looking for up front, they'll let their biases come in. They'll justify it later. So there's a really interesting study um, about hiring for police chiefs where people were shown resumes, like uh, one of a man, one of a woman. Um, and in one, in one scenario, uh, the man had more experience, the woman had more academic background, and the people choosing would choose the man, and uh, they would justify it by saying, oh, like, we want somebody with more work experience, like that's what this job needs. And then the other scenario, the man had more academic experience, the woman had more um, 
the work experience, these still chose a man and said, well, we, we just really need more academic experience in this case. So they would back into their choices with these justifications. But when the people choosing were told to write down their criteria ahead of time, they would be consistent with that. So if they said they wanted to have the academic background, then when they were presented with the two resumes and the woman had more of an academic background, they would choose her. Um, so there, there's actually a lot of really great research about how do you can mitigate your biases. And some of these things, are just they just make more sense. Um, it's not just about diversity and inclusion. It's just making these processes better. Um, so writing down uh, rubrics around not just hiring, but also promotion, um, very valuable. Uh, a lot of times in companies, when you're thinking about who's going to lead some new project, or who's going to uh, work on this like interesting new opportunity? There's not a lot of process around it, and people would just think like, oh, who who do I who would I know who might be interested in this, who might be good at this? And we tend to fall into the same biases um, there. If it's written out, it's like when we're choosing a tech lead, these are the things we're looking for, and this is our process. We're going to look at everybody who's at a certain level and has been in the company for a certain amount of time and consider them. Then you actually end up with a much better decision, and it has a side benefit of helping. Uh, diversity and inclusion people from the underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, looking forward, I think there's just a lot of hard work that still needs to be done in this space. Um, a lot of stuff is unknown. There are decades of research um, on diversity and inclusion. And I think it's very important that we look at what's been done already, um, what's been done in different industries, and all the academic research. But a lot is also unknown. The tech industry is one that moves very quickly. Startups are changing all the time. And we'll have to experiment and figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, I think we can take some of the same approach we have towards building products and building companies and apply it to things like diversity and inclusion. Um, try out different things, instrument them, look at the metrics, see what works. If it doesn't work, iterate on it and, and keep trying. Um, so some of the, the cool new things that are happening, for example, are more companies are playing with uh, apprenticeship programs. So looking at having longer on-ramps for people who are coming from the less traditional backgrounds, but recognizing that they have a lot of potential as long as they're given uh, the mentorship and onboarding and, and that capacity to learn. Um, not everybody is going to be able to be productive as an engineer after one month on the job, for example. But some people, if you give them a little bit more time, they will be very productive. They just need a longer on-ramp. So a few companies are doing these apprenticeship programs. Um, companies are trying different hiring practices. So uh, in engineering, for example, coding on the whiteboard has been a, you know, kind of a mainstay of software interviews for a long time. And companies are trying to move away from that into things that are more representative of actual on-the-job work. So coding on laptops with access to Google and Stack Overflow. Uh, which is more representative of the job and, and in the interviews actually sussing out how they would perform on the job. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting room for experimentation here and there are cool companies working on this. I think there's a lot of things that are in play right now and they just haven't been running for long enough for us to hear about them, but I'm very excited to, to see some of those write-ups and what comes out there. Um, another space that's really interesting is uh, looking at the intersection of new technology fields and how they relate to diversity and inclusion. So a couple of really hot spaces now, for example, are uh, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and AI. And I think there will be unique challenges for diversity and inclusion in those fields. Um, for crypto, for example, it could be a really cool new tool for inclusion, financial inclusion, um, or it could be a new form of digital colonization where we go into these different spaces and tell them, like, this is the new way you're going to do banking and finance um, and not including them in that. So um, that's a tricky one. It's also this whole new paradigm of, um, of digitization where economics are embedded in the technology itself, which is very different than the early internet. Uh, so it's kind of hard to anticipate what's going to happen here. Uh, there are some numbers, although none of these numbers are very accurate. There are some numbers that say like, most of uh, cryptocurrency wealth is held by men, like 95% is held by men. And that's going to have a lot of ramifications when economics are so embedded in the systems that are getting built. So there'll be new challenges there. How do we get people in? There are some efforts that have been, let's give some of, of these coins to just everybody in the community. But the problem is for people who don't know the space, who don't value the cryptocurrencies, they immediately change it to fiat currency and cash out. And the people who are the believers are, again, holding all the coins, even if you've had a really concerted effort to distribute them initially. Um, so there'll be interesting challenges here. Um, with AI, 
Uh, also really interesting because we are thinking, we're looking at how our biases get embedded in technology in products. Um, it's pretty clear, like, you know, you have these interactions on your on your website or your uh, your app, and there can be biases in, in what products are getting built. Um, but what's even more dangerous about something like AI is that there's biases in the data, and it's hard to even examine what's happening there. Um, you can have things like these runaway feedback loops, and we've seen some of this happen with Newsfeed um, on various social platforms. Um, there's a really interesting book on this called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, and she talks about some of these models uh, where you know, there may be some bias originally in the data set, some biases in the heuristics are used for the feature selection in the models, um, but what gets worse is when the outputs of these models get used as inputs again, um, and so you start to see problems like using these predictors for recidivism in the criminal justice system and continuing to perpetuate the systemic inequities. And so we have to think about ways to tamp down those feedback loops. Um, and sometimes we don't even understand that they're there. Uh, so there are researchers working now on interpretability of machine learning models, which is going to be very important going forward as it starts to intersect with these domains that have regulation you need to be able to explain. But there's technical work that needs to be done, and it's research, so it's hard to know where we're going to come out on that. Um, but one thing that is also promising about AI machine learning is that we can also try to use it to solve bias. Um, so there are companies like Textio, which helps you to look at your job postings and see if they're, if they're biased towards male or female candidates um, and help you to remove those and suggest alternates, alternative words. Um, some interesting research I was reading uh, from a couple years ago is uh, some, the, some models over um, text data that were having gendered relationships between things like uh, you know, doctor and men and nurse and women. Um, when they could identify the gender bias, they could also go into the models and actively de-bias and remove that bias, which is pretty powerful if you think about it. So with humans, even if you identify bias, you can't really get rid of it very easily. People will acknowledge that they have biases and they need to work on it, but you can't just go out and like zero out your vector and make sure that all future decisions are unbiased. But you can do that with AI models, potentially, um, depending on which ones you're building. If you know that you want to intentionally remove the biases here. Um, there's other research happening in how do you decorrelate um, different things. So say you're building models um, and financial models and you're not supposed to use race. This is, this, this is like actually regulated in some industries. Um, so you're forbidden from actually using race as an input to your models. But there are proxy variables. So looking at zip code, for example, you can end up basically getting the same uh, biases embedded. And so there are people working on how do we do post-processing around uh, the output of these models to actively decorrelate. So there's a lot of really interesting work happening. Um, and I'm pretty excited that the technology industry is just changing so much. And it's doing so much to set the direction of our future. And it's going to change how we interact with each other, how we interact with the world. Um, and so there's a lot of really cool opportunity um, to make positive change. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. oh. Can I start with the first question? Yeah. So this is all about hiring and bringing new people into existing organizations. Are you also seeing a trend of more women or other minority groups starting their own ventures, you know, whether it's uh, in industry or venture, venture capital, where they're saying, you know, I'm not going to wait to be anointed, I'm going to go start my own organization and do it differently? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of these firms um, popping up. So in the venture world, a lot of new funds have female or minority partners. A lot of these funds also do tend to be smaller, though. Um, so like the seed funds or maybe Series A. Um, so we're starting to make some change in helping entrepreneurs to get funded at an earlier stage, but there's still a lot more to be done there. If you look at total investment dollars, going to female founders, it was still uh, like only 2 or 3% of total VC money. So even if there's some work being done in the early stages, and we can talk about higher percentages of women getting funded in the seed stage, um, at, the, at the later stages, it's still pretty bad. Um, and it's hard for founders, or female founders, underrepresented minority founders, because they're still running up against the gatekeepers of capital now. So they, it might be easy to get a little bit of funding early on, but it's, it's still difficult. 
two questions. Uh, should diversity be an end in itself? And the second thing is, um, what are the actual numbers that you would say, if you saw them, you'd be like, okay, that's success in a tech company? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so two questions. One is, should diversity be an end in itself? And the second question was, what are the, the numbers that would be like a success? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question on diversity as an end in itself. Um, I think people will have different responses to this. Uh, and some of the justifications around diversity now are just very commercially motivated in order to get people's attention. I think there are justifications on the moral front, like we should just include everybody. Um, so it's not necessarily that diversity on your team should be an end in itself, but it's more the, the bigger picture. Like Everyone should have a shot at being a part of this industry, and we shouldn't have these um, circles of exclusion. Um, so there's a bit the moral argument. You think about what opportunities are we giving to people. Um, and on the, on the business side, uh, diversity has been shown to make teams better in the innovation context. So if you want to be in innovation, which the tech industry is, having diversity on your teams means that they're more creative. Um, they've been shown to have better financial outcomes um, and just generally produce better results which also intuitively makes sense when you have people coming from different backgrounds, they no longer carry necessarily the same assumptions and they realize that people may be approaching things from a different way and they work a little bit harder to justify their opinions and their arguments. Um, so it's just generally better for business. Uh, you think about the consumer case, like we're trying to build technology products for everyone. Uh, so it makes sense to have representation of those people in the teams that are building. Um, and sometimes you'll miss out on really obvious things because you're lacking those perspectives. Um, for example, when Apple Health Kit first launched, um, iOS 8, there was this thing you could track everything. You could track your, your steps. Um, you could do things like your sodium intake and like all these different uh, quantified self things. But they didn't have period tracking, which is for half the population, a very important form of quantified self that they've been doing manually for a long time. Um, and it seems like th those kind of oversights would be less likely with more diverse teams. Um, in terms of what would be kind of like a, a good goal to get to, I think around gender, getting to 50-50 is the most obvious uh, success outcome. And that's not just 50-50 representation overall, that's in leadership as well and all the decision-making roles. Um, if we're looking at startups, it should be 50-50 in equity and the cap tables. Um, so like what happens right now is a lot of times companies will have women in the non-technical roles, that are like support roles, the ones that don't get a lot of compensation or equity. And so even though overall it looks great, like 40-50% female in these companies, if you were to look at where the wealth is actually going to be in terms of like the equity, it's still very, very skewed. Um, on race, it's a little bit harder to say because um, it's hard to know if you want to benchmark to the city you're in, which seems like too small of a geography, or the state, or the country, or the world, right? Because a lot of Silicon Valley, for example, has immigrants coming from all around the world, and a lot from Asia. And so a lot of times people will see uh, in Silicon Valley and tech, the Asians are way overrepresented um, relative to the US population, where we're only 5%. Um, and that, some of that is just driven by immigration. So benchmarking to the world might be slightly better in some cases, but it still doesn't quite make sense if we're primarily building for an you know, in, for some companies, like primarily building for a US audience. Um, so I think it will depend for each company on, uh, on the race and ethnicity side of things. Um, some of it will depend on the target markets. And so if, you're, if your product is a consumer product and it's selling to a particular audience and having more of those people represented in, in your workforce is good. Um, but I don't think there's a hard and fast rule of what the targets should be around race and ethnicity. Um, we talk a lot about gender and race because those are the easiest ones to track and measure, and those are the uh, visible ones. There's also many other forms of diversity that are sometimes even impossible to track, um, where you require self-identification, and not everybody is going to self-identify. So some of those are even harder. But um, I think it is important to acknowledge that we just generally want inclusive environments where everyone can succeed. And some of the visible markers will give you um, hints at that. In the back. So I'm an economist, and we have very similar to economics to the ones that we talked about in tech. Um, and building on your last point, so about this idea of like achievable goals for gender diversity to be less 50-50, uh, like uh, an issue 
that I immediately got into pipelines. Mm -hmm. So I was coming up with Stanford Daily numbers on like the Stanford CS and time majors during your talk, and it looks like it's about the same in both, like 7 and 30 men women. So I was just wondering, maybe you're focusing on your time at Stanford, if you have any thoughts about how to get more women and uh, other underrepresented groups uh, excited about majoring in CS-related majors. Yeah. So I have lots of thoughts on pipeline. Because um, the, the first reaction is a lot of times people will use the pipeline issues as an excuse for not solving later issues around retention and inclusion. That's just the first thing. Um, however, there are actually pipeline issues if you look at the numbers as you were. As you were. Um, and I think it's a very multi-part problem. There's people who are doing really great work on the culture side of things. Like movies like Hidden Figures are great for getting black girls excited about technology when they see three black women who are NASA scientists like helping to, to launch um, you know, um, rockets. Um, so I think on the culture side, I think it's important um, trying to mitigate some of those stereotypes that may exist in pop culture. I think movies like The Social Network, which came out in 2010, can be actively harmful because they perpetuate the idea of like the, the nerdy hackers sitting in their basement in the dark coding by themselves. Um, so that culture piece is important. I think um, drawing more of the, the link between what a field of study is and what you can do with it is good. So in computer science uh, and engineering in particular, it's often very unclear, I think for little kids, like what they can do with this field of study. Um, and this is a bit of a generalization, but a lot of little girls, for example, are interested in helping the world and doing good things for the world. So they want to be doctors and nurses or veterinarians um, or teachers because they know that this kind of profession helps them to help other people. But they don't know that being a software engineer could help them help the world in a very scaled way and in a very different way. So drawing the link between what it is this field does, uh, or what it is this thing is, and like what kind of impact you can have can be helpful. Um, although this is like a, a generalized problem, it's just like helping people understand what are potential career paths in this world and what can you do with that. Um, I think there's also things that are uh, within the control of like schools and universities. Um, so I think coming into Stanford, we didn't have to declare majors, so you can have a lot, a lot of people who could potentially become CS majors. Um, and in my case, I chose not to become a CS major for my undergrad because I was so intimidated. I think there's now a lot of pretty active efforts to think about how do we make the curriculum more supportive? How do we make the environment generally better? Um, some of the things that happened in classes that I took at Stanford, for example, were um, you know, one professor that after we turned in our problem sets would ask us, like, how long did it take you to do this problem set? Zero to 10 hours, raise your hand. 10 to 20 hours, raise your hand. 20, 30 hours, raise your hand. 30 plus hours, raise your hand. And I took 30 hours to do my problem set. And like, I didn't know if other people were being truthful when they raised their hand at zero to 10, to 10 hours. But it was very intimidating to see that. And it made me feel more like I didn't belong there. Um, and it didn't occur to me later until later that people had very different calibration, um, self-calibration. Um, there are things like you know, just the examples that are used or the programming assignments. Like if they are interesting and relevant to people's lives, um, like people are more likely to want to do them. Um, trying to filter out or to, to build different paths for people who have more experience or le less experience is good. So it's not easy to be intimidated by the person sitting next to you who's been coding since they were eight. Um, that happened to me with some of my classmates who had just been coding for a long time. Some had done software engineering internships when they were in high school. And when I looked at them next to me, I just felt like I, there was no way I would ever catch up. It turns out that it didn't take that much time to catch up. It probably would have been one or two courses. Um, but I think splitting out those people from different backgrounds is helpful so people aren't getting the wrong impression of what's happening around them. Um, so you know, that, that's not even like that hard to do. And it's not that far um, away from like industry. But people will say, well, like, it's a pipeline problem. There's not people studying um, in universities. But it's actually not that far away. We could have solved that problem um, there. I think Stanford has like, made pretty good gains in CS on that front. Um, my year graduating from Stanford in 2009, there were three women in computer science. So now that it's 30%, that's a, that's a pretty big improvement. Um, but obviously, there's still a lot more to be done. Um, I, I Instead of maybe labeling them as you know, you have 
privilege or like you won't you uh, because you're not me, you can't understand me. So. Yeah, um, we were good. Yeah, so the question is about specific terms like privilege and colonization and trying to relate to people who may be in positions of more privilege and um, conveying to them the sort of work that needs to be done. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very tricky topic. Um, and I think ultimately it's about building connections to people and using things that make, using terminology and examples that make sense. Um, so if we're talking about marginalization, people feeling out of place, Everyone has had some experience where they've been out of place, like they haven't felt like they belonged. Um, and it's one that some people have every day walking into their offices, but even for the white men in tech, they've had experiences in the past where they didn't belong. And so being able to connect on those fronts is helpful. Um, some people are further along um, in their studies of these, of these issues, and they'll know more of the terminology. Um, other people aren't as far, so using the words that make sense in different contexts is good. Um, also just like generally on kind of like a philosophy of advocacy and working with people, um, there's a whole range of people's opinions and there's this whole spectrum. I think on the one end, you'll have people who are the advocates and activists already. On the other, you have skeptics and people who may actually be pushing back against diversity efforts. And then you also have a lot of people in the middle that are dispositionally inclined uh, to help with diversity and inclusion, but don't have all the language yet, or don't know, they don't have all that exposure yet. Uh, I think focusing on that middle group where um, they want to do the right thing, but don't quite have the language yet, uh, or don't quite know what they can do to be helpful is probably the, the best use of advocacy time. Um, and it's good to be gentle, try to create safe space where people can say things and they may not have the right terminology and they may say things that are slightly incorrect, um, but helping them to, to work through that and become good allies is, is like where I, think I try to focus and I think is a, a good place to focus energy. Um, you had mentioned that how uh, all of us can participate. Do you have like a cheat sheet or a checklist somewhere on your resources where one can look through and see that they fit in yeah, it's uh, a great question. Um, the question is about, is there a cheat sheet or checklist of things that everybody can do to help out? Um, so one thing that's very difficult is to give one checklist of things because everyone can do different things. Um, and for different people in different positions, there are different things that will be more leveraged or not. So if you're a hiring manager, there are certain things you can do in your capacity as a hiring manager to make sure that hiring is more inclusive. Um, if you're an individual contributor, It'll be different again, um, and depending on who you are and what experiences you've had, that may also be different. So there's no like one checklist. Um, I guess the one resource I would call out is Project Include, um, is the, the nonprofit I co-founded. We do have a lot of resources on there, and those are primarily focused on tech startups. But some of those things are generalizable, or you can um, take inspiration from some of the recommendations on there. But uh, the Project Include resources are organized. Um, so everything from how do you define culture to implement culture to how do you do training for managers um, and generally how do you resolve conflict. And so there's a lot of tidbits in there that may be helpful depending on who you are and what kind of role you're playing uh, in your company or in the ecosystem. You spoke about diversity reports of companies about actual hirings, but what about applications reports? How many people actually apply for the job and the diversity there? So no one has released those that I have seen in any holistic way. Um, I tried to push some companies to do that and got a lot of pushback on that. Um, so I think there are legal concerns around that, uh, around potential discrimination. So if there's any difference in the representations of people in the hiring pipeline to actual hires, uh, that's grounds for discrimination lawsuits. So a lot of companies are very skittish about that, and they don't want to put that out there unless there's a very compelling reason for them to do that. I do think a lot of companies look at it internally, because they want to see where the drop-off is, and if there's differences in like the application pool to the referrals to like the outbound. Um, but I think it'll be hard to, to get that data publicly because of the legal risks. Well, how is it possible for a company that is very big and there's like hundreds and hundreds of employees, but they don't already have diversity, how can they change to have their 
Yeah. Um, question is around uh, big companies that don't have diversity, how do they change to actually get it? And this is one of the challenges that is very real right now. Like big companies can't shift their numbers that much. Um, for companies that are hiring very quickly and hiring a lot relative to their current base of employees, they can shift their numbers. Um, for very large companies, they're hiring to fill attrition, uh, maybe a little bit of growth, but it's hard to change numbers substantially. One other thing I would tell companies like that to look at is uh, the inclusion metrics and engagement metrics. So even if you don't have a lot of diversity in your team right now, you can try to make the people who are there feel very included and um, look at the differences in inclusion metrics sliced by different demographics. So do the female engineers feel as included as the male engineers? Are they as confident in the direction of the company? Um, do your like black women in these different functions feel as good as the other people, like the white men in these functions. Um, so there's interesting analysis you can do there, and those things can actually be moved in the short term without changing hiring. Um, and I think it's something that companies do need to look at a lot more at. It's very easy to do press around your diversity numbers and these demographics, um, but what's arguably more important is that the people who are there feel supported and included, and they actually have a chance to do well. Thank you.